Hey folks, I think we are live. I'm not sure, but I think we are. We're still sorting this out. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Elk Talk Live, the Q&A session brought to you by Bowtech Archery, brought to you by Loopold Optics, and by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We're doing this every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, and we turned it on a minute or two early this time because we wanted to make sure whether or not we we're having the proper feed. And as you know, last week, our hardware, something fritzed out, so we had to hit the reset button. So that also plays into one of my theories in life that if I say eight o'clock and you show up at eight o'clock, this is what I tell the camera crew. If I say we're leaving at eight and you show up at eight, you're 10 minutes late. That's just how it is. And if you show up five minutes late, you get left. So, sorry. Hopefully you didn't miss any of this, but we're gonna get into this right away. Uh, as you know how it works, I got to look over here to the monitor to read the questions as they pop up. But before we get started, this is, what's today? June 21st. We got this one and then we got next week we're doing another one. And then we're going to do the drawing for the Bowtech Rain 7 Smart Bow. So to be in that drawing, text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131, and if you're in Canada, 393939. And that's all we're asking. And then, also, please share with your friends. If you're watching this and you're enjoying it, I hope you'll share it with people because we're really putting a lot of emphasis in this. We're trying our best to give as much helpful information as possible, and our three partners are really putting a lot behind this to try to get more elk hunting information to you. So... With that, we're going to start with, oh, <clears throat> Jonathan Donlin had a question about this thing over my left shoulder here. He asked, does this thing have a name? Well, I have a name for this bull, but I'd like to know what you guys would want to name him. I think if you guys all give us names for the bull, we'll look through all those suggestions, and next week, we'll name him. Right now, I call him Clyde. But I don't know if Clyde's a good name for a bull elk like that. The story behind it is Marcus, the camera guy right back here, the first time he took his wife, who was at the time his girlfriend, out hunting, he shot this bull out from underneath her. He's back there laughing. And he's, he's like, well, there's a big story behind that. No, we're not telling you the whole story. This guy shot this bull out from underneath his girlfriend. And yet, she still married him. So, I guess he must be a pretty good guy. But, anyhow, what's, uh, what's our first question here? Oh, when are our TV shows going to be on Amazon Prime? We're still working on that. Because the show is titled Loopold's Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg, the Loopold part is considered to be advertising under the Amazon rules, so we're trying to work through that. So, hopefully, sometime in the next month or so, they'll be there, but... You just never know. You submit them and it can come back and, and bite you. So, oh, what's the efficient maximum range for elk with the 308? I would answer this question the same if it was a 300 win mag, a 270, a 30-06. The maximum efficient range is what that person is comfortable with given the conditions they're under. So I've shot some elk at pretty long ranges with the 308 because it was perfect. I had a perfect rest. The elk didn't know I was there. The breathing was great. Everything was the way you want it. And then I've had some times where I've just run up a hill or the wind is howling or I, whatever. I didn't feel comfortable and it was only 200 yards. And I wanted a different shot or wanted to get closer. So the answer is it depends. It depends on a lot of things. Mostly it depends on when you line up on that, do you have that, I got this feeling? And if you do, Odds are you're probably going to fill that tag. So uh, let's see. When are you going to do a trailer dump video? I know some of you watch our bag dump videos about elk and bear hunting and other stuff. Probably when we get out, <clears throat> we have a Nevada archery mule deer tag this year, and we're probably going to go and do the trailer dump when we're out on that hunt. And uh, you're going to see I bring all kinds of stuff. I bring my primary bow, which is my Rain 7. I bring my backup bow. I bring targets, I bring camp, I bring water. It's, you will think I ran away from home when I do that. So, 
I've hunted elk with a rifle for years. What's a piece of advice for a first time archery hunter? Get ready to have more fun than you've ever had in your life. That's the answer. Uh, that's the advice. I had no idea how much fun archery elk hunting would be and how addictive it would be and how frustrating it could be. It's, I mean, you're, you're really accepting a challenge when you decide that archery is your game. And I love it both. I love, I just love hunting elk. So for me, the beauty of archery season is, or using a bow, is that archery seasons usually start in late August in some states like Idaho, Colorado, Utah. And then I can hunt them here in my home state of Montana until like October 10th or something with a bow. And then I can jump into all these rifle hunts. So first piece of advice is probably just don't give up, don't be frustrated. And if you're talking like the mistake I always made and still make sometimes, it's I did not give the wind enough credit. I, I always thought, oh, I can cheat the wind. No, with a bow, when you gotta get that close, Cheating the wind is not an option. So, all right, what's our next one? Um, what kind of grass do the elk prefer? It varies by latitude and by elevation. Uh, how to find the best source of green grass late in the season to find cow elk? That's a good question because that is where you're gonna find cow elk. I like how this person's thinking. In the late season, the best feed is where the cow elk are going to be. You're gonna find that based on what type of feed and grasses grow in that area. And I would talk to a range manager or a range biologist and say, hey, what are the, the elk feeds that are growing in the area I'm hunting? Because some of them start to green up earlier and dry out later, some green up a little later. So it's not like all of the grasses and all of the forbs, all of the nutrition that elk are looking for have the same calendar cycle of greenness versus going to the, to the point of dormant in the fall and getting brown. They all are on a different schedule. So find out where you're hunting and find out what the grasses are. And you might find in some areas there aren't a lot of grasses. So there are cliffs rows, it's, it might be mahogany, it might be uh, I've seen them eating on, uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to laugh when I say this, I've seen them eating on uh, pinion and juniper uh, fruits, uh, berries and, and nuts. So it, it just depends, but I like the way you're approaching it. You know you're going to find cow elk where the best food is, and that's the question to ask. All right, where are we at next? What are the best tags you drew this year? Oh gosh, I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm going to be in Arizona when they're bugling with a rifle in hand. Kapoom. And then I drew a Wyoming elk tag where I get to archery hunt until the rifle season opens and the rifle season opens in September. So I can be there archery hunting for a long period and then I can go and uh, rifle hunt it. So those, those two tags are... I didn't really expect them, but I'll take them. All right. Um, what should I be looking for when online scouting for archery elk? Well, remember we talk about the five periods of the elk calendar, that the seasonal periods we hunt them. If, if we're talking about the, the prime elk kind of archery season, you're looking at peak rut. You're going to be looking, again, for where are cows going to be able to get food because where there are cows, there will be bulls. Where is the bedding cover that the cows are going to use with proximity to water? So it's, going to, you're, you, it's not like you show up and it's like, oh, I found the one spot. Know that elk move across their habitat areas. So there's going to be spots that they're using. And you might go there and they're not there today. They're in one of the other spots within their range that has those same basic needs that they have. So look for what cows need during the peak of the rut and you'll find bulls. What cows need are food, bedding cover, next to water, somewhere close to water. Chris, let's see, Bradley Johnson. Randy, would you rather go back to a unit that you know some of the land or drive into a new unit that may have a new burn area? Hmm, new burn all of a sudden got my attention. Uh, that's a toss up. Um, odds are I'm probably gonna go back to an area that I know. Um, 
that's the beauty of some of these states. Like Colorado, you got over-the-counter archery tags. You got second and third over-the-counter rifle tags. You can go every year and pretty soon you get to know the habits. You get to know the lay of the landscape. You get to know whatever. Same in Montana. Everyone hears me say that Montana has unbelievable archery elk hunting. Their archery elk hunting is better than their rifle elk hunting. You can draw that Montana general elk tag just about every year. Keep coming, keep coming. Pretty soon you've got it figured out. So I'm probably going to, in the question, I'm going to go to school on what I learned the last year and maybe the next year and the next year, and that's going to give me a better opportunity as much as I love Burns. Uh, let's see, Chris Anderson, what's your personal favorite time to hunt elk in Colorado with the bow? The first week, second week, or fourth week? The answer is yes, <laughs> whatever fits your calendar. But no, I, I'm probably going to go there in the peak of the rut. Um, and I know some people will say, well, in Colorado, the muzzleloader guys are there at the same time as archery guys. I get it. I'm still going to be there during that peak rep period. And the reason is, is I want the enjoyment of crazy, rutting, noisy, bugling, loud bull elk. That's whether I fill my tag or not, whether I run into muzzleloader hunters or not, that is part of what gives me fun and satisfaction out of this hunt. So I'm probably going to be there sometime between September 12th and September 25th, wherever that fits my calendar and my schedule. So what else we got here? Let's see. Kevin Barado. I've heard that bulls use wallows early season, pre-rut. Yes, that's true. In some parts of the country. In other parts of the country, they don't start using wallows until peak rut. Ah, I have found that in the really warmer southwest, areas, they will use it from pre-rut all the way through the rut um, to wallow, to just cool off. Uh, up here in our northern latitudes, I would agree with the first comment. My, You will find them throughout the hunting season, but the use of them when they're actively being used, my experience, others might have a different experience, is I find that those wallows get used more in the pre-rut, September 1st to say September 10th. Okay, now we don't know if this is a, a question that is humor, sarcasm. So we're going to answer it, but understand that I might have some humor and sarcasm in my answer. How many times a day should I apply bear spray? Uh, <laughs> I know this is a sarcastic question, but unfortunately, a lot of people come out west where there are grizzly bears and they do the bear spray thing. And they talk, the, the question goes on to ask, how should I apply it? Where should I apply it? And I always think these are, are uh, jokes when forest rangers or biologists tell me about this stuff. But a lot of people think that bear spray is like bug dope, that you spray it on or you spray it on your tent. Don't apply. Do not apply it. Uh, it <laughs> when the question came up, uh, it seemed kind of funny. Okay, let's see. If you had to make a trip from Wyoming or Montana uh, to Mo Mon Montana or Wyoming from Tennessee, would you fly or drive? I'd get two or three buddies and I'd drive. And how would you get your meat and stuff back home if you flew? Well, if I had to fly, I'd plan on writing a big check to get all that meat home because it's expensive. Most of the airlines require that it's got to be frozen, so you're probably going to have to leave it with a processor here and they're going to have to overnight it. If you can, get a few buddies and drive out and take turns rotating on the driving and it's amazing how much cover you can or how much ground you can cover when you do that you can keep your elk cold in the two to three days it would go take you to drive from say montana or wyoming to tennessee and your your meat would be fine when you get there so that's what i would do let's see adam bender if you had to pick one what's your go-to loophole rifle scope Whew, don't make me pick one. I got VX3i. I just, where is it? Is it in here? Uh, I got a new VX5. I just had it here. Oh, I, it's at home. Uh, the, I'm getting ready to try out the new VX5 HD. Uh, last year, uh, my three main rifles that I use all had the VH, VX6 uh, on it. It would really come down to what's your budget and what features you're looking for. If budget's not an issue, I'd go with the VX6, uh, the HD version. Uh, the VX3i is an unbelievable scope 
for the money. And then the VX5 is that kind of fill in in between those two spots. It really depends on what you're doing. I would, every scope I have has the CDS, the custom dial system in it. Just so simple, so easy to use. Um, it, it really comes down to what distances you plan on shooting, but go with any of those three and you're gonna be happy. All right, <clears throat> Randy, I'm going on a solo archery hunt in Colorado this fall. What can I tell my wife to ease her mind of something bad happening? Um, boy, I, I really don't know. Uh, you're a capable person, you're prepared, you've got all your emergency stuff. Um, if you need to, and it's really that important, have a schedule when you're going to check in, either by cell phone or now these Delo new uh, Garmin bought out Delorme, this new inReach. I'm going to be buying one. I saw one the other day and a friend was showing me how to use them and how slick it works for them. You will see me carrying a Garmin uh, inReach this fall. I'm, it just, it makes sense, especially in a situation if you're solo and you have a spouse that's worried about it. You know, uh, make sure they're comfortable just like you are. Dean DeBro, how far from your hunting spot should you set up your tent? How do you stay close to them but not blow them out by camping too close? I don't go and camp super close because elk move a lot. So I might say, oh, I'm going to camp here and the elk today are a mile away. Well, those elk, walking a mile in a, in a day for an elk, is a, that's just like a trip to the bathroom for them. So I don't camp in any place where I think I'm going to blow the elk out. I will, <laughs> I'll go so far as to force myself to walk an extra one or two miles or three miles just to know, hey, I've got elk there. Why do I want to go and set up a camp and blow them out of there? I don't. So that's why you'll see in our episodes, a lot of times we're doing a lot of hiking. That's why we use hiking and trekking poles because we're not going back in there and setting up right on the elk. That is a really good way to blow them out. And once you blow them out, then you just gotta spend the whole time trying to find them again. And you've heard me say many times, I spend 90% of my time finding an elk and 10% of my time trying to kill that elk. Once I find them, I don't wanna screw it up. I don't wanna push them out of there. So. I'll, I'll stay further. My camp will be further away rather than closer. Uh, do you have a preferred brand of camera or filming equipment? Everything we've converted over to is Sony stuff. I, you know, whatever might work for you. If you got a bunch of Canon lenses or Nikon lenses or whatever, maybe that's what works for you. But for us, our uh, XD cams that you see we're recording this on, uh, we use a lot of the mirrorless cameras, the A600, the A6300 from Sony. They just, they work for what we do. I'm not saying that's what you got to use, but that worked for us. All right. I know that you take certain precautions in grizzly country, but do you take any specific precautions for mountain lions? I don't. Maybe I should. Uh, I'm, I, I've just spent so much time and all my friends have spent so much time Mountain lions are very nocturnal. They hunt with their eyes, and their eyes allow them a sight advantage at low light periods. So the odds are they're not looking for trouble. It's, they gotta be really, really hungry before they're gonna come and create a problem for you. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, and I'm sure a few people have had encounters, but it doesn't even enter my mind because the odds are so low. Um, almost to the point where I think my odds of getting uh, <laughs> run over by a unicorn might be about the same. Probably not quite <laughs> that low of odds, but still, it's not enough to worry about in my mind. So, all right. I drew a late season cow tag. What food sources would you target and how would you locate them when e-scouting? Thanks, Randy. Um, again, it's back to that question that someone asked earlier. Find what the, the, the best feed is in your, your unit or your area for that late period. Have they switched from grasses to something else? Are they now, is, is it deep snow and the grasses are covered so they're having to go to more forbs and stuff like that? Uh, it, elk are, are generalists. They can make a living on a lot of things. So their preferred is lovely green grass in the, in the summer and early fall. But if this is a late season cow tag, as you said, they might have to shift to non 
preferable or non-traditional uh, uh, food sources. Find out from the range managers and the biologists in your area what their food source is, food source is at that time. Go and find where it grows. Does it grow on north slopes? Does it grow on southwest slopes? Or what does it do? Does it grow at lower elevation, higher elevation? Those are the things that are going to put you where the food is and where you find the food is where you're going to find late season cow elk. Where's the best state to go on my first elk hunt? Ooh, anywhere that you can go. <laughs> you, you're probably getting from these questions that for me it's about just going. Don't worry about it. Uh, I don't know where you live. If you have elk in your home state, go there. If you don't, uh, it, it, it's going to require you to apply somewhere probably. Uh, I, if you are an archery hunter, my preference of, of places that are easy to draw would be Montana and Wyoming. If you're a, a rifle hunter, I would say Wyoming and Colorado. And th those are the places I'd look to. Yeah, you might, I, I would always apply in New Mexico because if you're new to elk hunting, there are no what I call uh, point schemes. In other words, you as a first time applicant have the same odds as me as someone who's been applying for 25 years. So apply there also. Just make sure you have some place. And we've done this video on our YouTube channel that talks about how to hunt elk every year. So a, a good starting point would go to the YouTube channel and pull up that video of how to hunt elk every year and it give you a lot of ideas of places you can go and do it. There are no bad elk hunts in my mind. So. Again, if you, uh, before the next question, if you want to be in the June drawing for the smart bow from Bowtech, the Rain 7, make sure you text Randy, R A N D Y, to 313131. And if you're in Canada, 393939. And if we're giving you anything that's worth a darn here, which I hope we are, I hope you'll be sharing this with your friends. All right, PJ Urban, do you prefer to eat bull, cow, doe, uh, as far as meat they're talking about? Um, if you give me my choices, I'm going to eat some alfalfa fed doe or cow. But a lot of times the tags that we apply for are uh, bull only or branch antlered bull. You know what? I've, I, occasionally you will run into a really old bull that is tough. Um, usually flavor is still the same, but it's just the toughness and texture isn't there. But you give me my preference of what I want on my table. It'd be a year and a half old cow elk or a two year and a half year old white tailed doe. I just, they're, they're <laughs> when they've been eating in the alfalfa fields or on the grasses, they're just really, really tasty. So, uh, let's see. Ryan Anderson asks Big difference between bow hunting Rocky Mountain bulls and rosies? I wish I could tell you because I've never hunted rosies, Roosevelt elk. I want to, it's high on my list. And since two of the sponsors of this podcast, or this uh, live hunt cast Q&A session, are in Oregon, Leupold and Bowtie, I got to start working that network and say, hey guys, what do you say we go chase some Roosevelt elk? Because it's, if you look at my bucket list right now, Roosevelt elk is about as high up there as anything on that list. So I wish I could answer the question. All right, Eric Pretorius, if hot out and you are packing elk out, do you agree with putting a quarter into moving water to keep cool? No. Advantages or disadvantages? Moisture is a sure way to garner and gather a, uh, some sort of bacteria or other problem. That meat will cool just fine if you find shade and wind. And once you submerge that in water, you don't know what kind of bacteria is living in that water. There's all kinds of things that can be a problem with submersing your meat directly into the water. And then it comes with, all right, how do I dry it off once I put it in my game bag? You, you know what creates bacteria? Moisture and heat. So I, I would never do that. Some people might say otherwise. I would never do it. Patrick Hahn, do you have locking differentials on your truck? Yes. I would not buy a truck that not, did not have a rear locking differential. I just, I need it too often. So, um, all right. Uh, Brendan Warburock, 
I'll be hunting bull elk in Saskatchewan, Canada, three deer species, and mountain sheep in British Columbia. What advice do you have to get home front approval for spending the majority of your holidays on hunting? And mine, my wife, unlike yours, does not fish for walleyes. <laughs> uh, good luck with that is what I've got to say. Um, you're going to be uh, indebted for family vacations. If she has a sister, I would make sure her and her sister get to go on a vacation. New furniture is probably in the works, a little jewelry. Uh, just consider that this hunting trip or this season of all these trips is going to cost you more than you thought. Uh, let's see. Trevor Varner, if I plan on hiring a guide, what should I guess on spending on a guided trip? Um, boy, that, that depends. Uh, it depends on the quality that, that that outfitter has. It depends on the logistics of, of how hard it is for them to get you to their camp. Uh, buyer beware. I mean, I, I think a better question might be, how do I do research about a guided hunt? Uh, referrals are the number one thing. Referrals of unsuccessful people, not just successful people. Um, and understand that there's usually a reason why some of the outfitters can charge a higher price. They run a high quality operation. They're booked two or three years in advance. They, they have that good of an outfit. So uh, as far as the price you're going to spend, it's going to be a little bit all over the map. But if I was going on a fully guided elk hunt and someone offered, to it, offered it to me for less than $4,000, I'd start to question why is it so cheap. It's elk hunting, guided elk hunts are not cheap. All right, Dale Schuler, best broadhead choice uh, and 60 pound or 70 pound draw. Um, for me, I, I'm not partial to any broadhead company or brand. Uh, someone asked a few uh, episodes ago, I'm very partial to fixed blade broadheads for a couple of reasons. One, it's what I've used all my life. A lot of people I respect, that's what they use. I'm sure mechanicals kill lots of elk every year, so I'm not s discounting that. Go with what you're comfortable with. As far as draw weight, I've got a a bum problem with my wrist right here and my right shoulder right here. I mean, I need to be left-handed <laughs> for the problems I have. So I'm down at 60 pounds. Um, I, I get it that a lot of people, 70 pounds is no problem. For me, I want 60 pounds because I that's about as far as I can cock my wrist back right there. Um, so I would uh, do do what works best for you from the point of where are you comfortable? Don't try to be the He-Man because a proper arrow, a really sharp, uh, well-made broadhead placed in the right location on any animal in North America up to a moose, it's going to kill it with a 60-pound bow. Do what, it's kind of like rifle hunting. Don't overgun yourself and, and create accuracy issues because you're over, overgunned. Same with a bow. Don't overdraw yourself. Don't, don't put too much poundage in there just because you've heard that that's what you need to do. A lot of elk get killed with 55 pound bows. So, Kurt Bowman, what's better to call a bull in, a bugle, or a cow call? Um, I don't hold myself out to be the best caller in the world. My experience is if I'm looking for a bull that's a mature bull, I have way better luck with bugles than I do with cow calls. Just what works for me in the way I hunt. Um, sometimes I don't even call. I let them do the calling and I try to get in there. So, all right, someone asked me, 100 grain or 125 grain broadheads? And it kind of goes back to my old school kind of thinking. I'm way more comfortable with 125 grain broadhead. Uh, 100 grain kills lots of elk. I want a wide cutting gap. I want a really sturdy broadhead and I'm I shoot a heavy setup and I just I'm not one of these guys who's shooting elk at 80 yards I'm not so I want a heavy uh, broadhead I want a fixed blade and I go with that so I'm it's you know it's like a lot of things a lot of it's gonna be personal choice okay <clears throat> Marcus Hubrid Randy my unit is on fire if it's out soon, will it be 
too early to hunt the burn come October. Uh, if it gets put out now in June and you get some, it's you're probably in one of the drier areas. Most of the fires right now are down in the, the southern latitudes. There's a good chance you'll get monsoons uh, in uh, starting in July and August and September. So if your hunt's in October, don't overlook it because if it's not a super intense fire, as quick as those first monsoons come in July, you will get a sprouting of grass about that tall and the elk will be in there hammering that. So don't overlook it. If it torches it to almost like moonscape, you might have to wait a year before much comes back up in there. Uh, let's see, Tim Van Nguyen. How long did it take you to shoot your first public land elk? It, <laughs> I flunked, I did every possible mistake you could think for the first six years. So that tells you how many mistakes I made. Any inspiration for a guy who went on a archery solo public land over the counter Colorado hunt for 15 days and couldn't get close to one? Yeah, keep at it. I made every possible mistake in the world. I hunted six seasons without killing a bull elk on public land. And then I pulled myself back and said, what am I doing wrong? And I found that I tried shortcuts. I didn't understand the elk well enough. I hadn't done my research to know what are the five periods that elk live in that we hunt them, what are the calendar periods? And I didn't do enough research to understand what their needs are in each of those five periods. Because I'd go and scout elk in late August and I'd get all excited. And then in rifle season, I couldn't find them. Well, guess what? In October rifle season, they have a different need. They're not going to be where I saw them in August. It took me six years to figure out how to do that. And since then, now it's like, hey, this elk hunting isn't nearly as hard as I made it out to be. So don't give up. Keep going. Part of the benefit of mistakes is it's learning. And I'm not an expert in any stretch. I just get to go on six to eight hunts a year between myself and other people. And in that process, we make tons of mistakes and we learn what else we should be doing to not repeat that mistake. So what's the best way you prepare yourself to get into shape for a hunt? I think someone, this is a loaded question from somebody because I drive a desk for a living. I'm a CPA. I disinherit the federal treasury in my other life. And for me, it's hiking. I, I hike. I'm not a gym rat. And that's fine for people who are. I'm not. I'm 52 years old. I sit at a desk part of the year, but I make an appointment on my calendar to go on a hike at least four or five days a week. Unfortunately, this summer I've been so busy, I've been slacking on that. And I don't deprive myself. I try to eat well. And if I have the craving, I'll go get a Dairy Queen and not worry about it. It's not the end of the world. If I am in good enough shape to go and kill public land elk in the backcountry, I can guarantee you that you are. So, what's Bradley Johnson have to say? I must be watching too much elk hunting videos. Is a broadside shot the only one you would approve taking while archery hunting? Again, that, you're going to get 100 answers based on it depends. For me, I want the broadside shot or slightly quartering away. I've passed on shots quartering to me. I've passed on frontal shots because it's too far and I don't think I'd take a frontal shot unless it was because of my talent level not being what some others are. I wouldn't take a frontal shot that's more than probably six or eight yards away, but other people do. The beauty of, a, of a, any type of broadside shot, you're probably going to get an entrance wound and an exit wound. So when it takes off, you got two places that the blood is coming out. Even if it's slightly quartering away, the odds are you're going to get an exit and probably, or, or an entrance and probably an exit wound unless it hits the shoulder blade here. If it hits the shoulder blade here, it's going to bounce back and it's, as the bull's running, that blade's going to be in there carving and cutting. So um, it's, I, I wouldn't base that all on what you see on TV. It's just common sense. The uh, bow hunter ed classes, uh, have some great stuff on that about what shot angles you should be looking for by species. So, Derek Keegan, what do you do to make sure you, what do you make sure you have with you when you field dress your elk? Uh, a sharp knife. I use the scalpel blade knives. I use uh, the Gerber Vital. 
Uh, I usually have with me uh, a Gerber Gator Premium, which is a heavy duty fixed blade knife. I have game bags. I use the synthetic game bags by Caribou Game Beer. Can't, game, <laughs> Caribou Game Gear. Um, and I have a headlamp and I have a really good backpack. You see me use the Mystery Ranch packs. Um, it's just the way that you gotta do it. You, you gotta be prepared. We have a video on YouTube. It's called The Gutless Method. It's about getting your elk out. And if you like that video and you want to, you can go to our website and there's a banner, that, or, or Hunt Talk Forum, that says download episodes. We have this where you can download that to your phone to have this step-by-step -step thing with you out in the field. It's, it's not that hard once you do it. So I think this is the last question, unless someone has a really good one after this, but Zane Gray, applying in the West, is it worth it to put in for the best units for each state or is it better to try for a lesser hunt unit and hunt more? I put in for lesser units and hunt more, even though, because I'm lucky that I'm allowed to apply in so many states. There might be this state or that state where it's like, ah, I'm gonna shoot for the stars, you know? If I don't draw, no big deal. But my strategy is I've got to have the core of my applications for elk, whether it's archery or rifle. I have to be looking at these lesser units where my draw odds are much better. Otherwise, I'm not going elk hunting. Or I, I still am because I've got, I li and I know some of you are like, well, you live in Montana and get over the counter tag. Yeah, you're right. But if all I do are kind of home run swings on these applications, I'm not going to get to hunt elk as much as I want. And I'm happy to go hunt a lesser unit. A lot of really good bulls are killed on these lesser overlooked units. Don't think that just because it's not recommended by some uh, application service or some research service that it's not a good unit. There's still a lot of good ones. So, all right, we'll wrap it up. I think we're going to have to. I'm trying to think if we got one more question. I don't know that we do, but as we wrap it up, remember. The end of June, we're drawing this prize for the, the Bowtech Rain 7 Smart Bow. Text Randy, R A N D Y, to 313131. Or if you're in Canada, A, eh? 393939. And if you like this stuff, please share it with your friends. Let people know about it. Next week, <laughs> This could get interesting. So the reason we've been doing this in the studio is we wanted to sort out the hardware, the logistics. Our goal is we're gonna take this whole project with us this fall. And we're gonna have to be doing it from some crappy cell service. We might have to go park outside the coffee shop and poach some Wi-Fi from somebody. Y you have no idea and we have no idea where we're gonna be doing these as hunting season starts. We're gonna try to stay on the same schedule. But next week, I think we're gonna go somewhere else and just give it a whirl. Uh, so we're, we're going to see how that works. I, I hope we don't fall on our face and say, oh, gosh, this, this was a bad idea. But uh, give a big thanks if you can. Go out to the Facebook, Instagram, and other social media pages of Bowtech, of Leupold, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and thank them for making this possible. Um, hopefully some of this is worth listening to and, and worth watching. Our goal is to just try to lower the hurdles so that Everybody who wants to be an elk hunter doesn't make all the same dumb mistakes I've made along the way. And the lower the hurdles, hopefully the greater the likelihood of success. The more success you have, the more elk hunting you're going to do, the bigger advocate you're going to be for elk and conservation. So thanks for watching. Do we, what, 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 what? Do, do we have one more? Oh, hold on. We, we got another question that the filter here has said we need to do. Danny... Centenary, would you rather have an arrow pass through completely on an elk or like the arrow to stick in them and grind more internally? I would rather have a complete pass through through the lungs, if at all possible, just because tracking and trailing is going to be a little bit easier. Sometimes when that arrow sticks in there, yeah, it's still lethal because it's grinding as he's moving, but that arrow, if it doesn't break off and it's sticking in there, that's... I, it's not completely like a cork, but it can seal that wound to not have nearly the blood uh, on the ground that you would have if that arrow went completely through. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week. And uh, are we done, boys? Dairy Queen done?
What? Dairy Queen time. Shaking their head. What do we got going here? Are we done? No, we're not done. What are we doing? I. <laughs> Hello. 